Congressman Timmons, thank you so much for joining us. Great to be with you. Thanks for having me. Why don't we start with your background, where you're coming from, and maybe a little bit on the district. You know, what's unique about your district, and uh, how's it changed over time? Sure. Um, well, I represent South Carolina's fourth congressional district, and this is my second term, so I've been in office for three years. Before that, I was in the state Senate. I served there for two years. Um, I represent Greenville and Spartanburg, South Carolina. It's the most geographically compact district. Um, we have fairly uh, reasonably sized for South Carolina urban areas in Greenville and Spartanburg with a lot of suburban and rural areas surrounding it. Um, the well, I'll give you the rest of my background. So um, I was a prosecutor for five years. I have started a number of businesses. I own a CrossFit gym, a hot yoga studio. I had a law practice. Um, I had an event venue. I have a real estate development, a serial entrepreneur of sorts. And the reason I ran for office initially was because my frustration with government. Um, uh, doing my real estate development, the, the government um, did some things that I think they shouldn't have done. And they kept moving the goalposts. And it was very challenging to um, be successful, and it shouldn't be that way. And as a prosecutor, the uh, South Carolina criminal justice system is in much need of reform. Uh, it lacks any degree of technological update. And um, I was very passionate about trying to facilitate better justice for victims, but also helping to get people back out into the workforce after they um, do, serve their time and uh, get back into the workforce. So, um, you know, the district is fairly unique. We had uh, an enormous amount of textiles for 200 years. And in the 70s, all the textile mills closed. Um, we sent a lot of our jobs overseas. And so the, the whole area from the 70s until the early 90s was, was really struggling. Um, we were able to reinvent ourselves. And now we have uh, Michelin North America's headquarters. We have the, the largest uh, BMW factory in the uh, U.S. there. They employ about uh, 12, 14,000 people. We have all of their suppliers and uh, an enormous amount of foreign investment. So we've really rebounded. Things are going extremely well. Um, the district is fairly conservative. Uh, it went uh, 60 56% for President Trump. Uh, wait, that's not right. 64% for President Trump. There we go. Um, so it is a very conservative district. I replaced Trey Gowdy. Trey Gowdy was my predecessor. He um, served for uh, eight years and decided to retire. I joke that he knew something because the last three years have been pretty challenging. Um, but, you know, it's an honor to serve in Congress. My, my campaign slogan was uh, Washington's broken. And um, once I got up here, I, I didn't appreciate how right I was. So um, look forward to talking about how we can improve uh, this important institution. And again, thanks for having me. Sure. So in terms of you know, your service, you started because of issues, right? Locally, it sounds like. Uh, and then you came to the U.S. You know, Congress. Um, was it the same thing? You had particular issues that you wanted to to uh, to pursue and you know have you implemented those into bills and you know this kind of leads into my question of you know, my first set of questions around bill creation you know you, you come to Congress do you already have in mind what you want to do from a legislative point of view or is it something that has come from you know subsequent to you getting here you know whether it's constituents or whether it's party etc you know where do those ideas come from that you want to those changes you want to make from a legislative point of view so. You know, when you're running for office, you got to have your your top three priorities. And um, I ran on debt, immigration, and economic opportunity. So um, coming into Congress in the 116th Congress, being in the minority, um, there's not a lot of real legislating that you have the opportunity to do. Um, but um, I did my best to really dig into procedure, build relationships and uh, work with then uh, President Trump to try to accomplish whatever objectives I, I could. Um, when I was in the state Senate, I learned that the, your ability to mold outcomes in the executive branch is, is pretty serious. And um, I've been able to build relationships in different executive agencies to try to ask questions, to try to make sure that uh, the federal government is treating my district appropriately. So, Got a lot of success stories there. Um, constituent services has been a big, big issue. 
we have bills on debt, um, working on some immigration stuff and um, economic prosperity is just getting the government to get out of the way. Um, and, you know, we need to have certain regulations, but if we always constantly add, we never take away, it gets overly burdensome. So we got to streamline and accomplish the objective of keeping people safe, but also allow the free market to uh, pursue the, the best economic outcome. So um, while we have a lot of different legislative uh, priorities and we're working hard in that regard, at the end of the day, being in the minority, it, it's it's challenging. So I, I've done my best to uh, work with uh, my colleagues across the aisle to get things done. So in terms of the your own bills, it sounds like you're obviously constrained being in the minority. What about in terms of other bills, you know, to either co-sponsor, support, or oppose? You know, what's the logic that goes through your mind when you do it? Is it mainly your you're your chatting with your staff? Is it values based? Is it numbers based? You know, can you give us a sense for what's the thought process when a when a vote comes up or when it when you, when a co sponsorship is requested? You know, what goes through your mind? What are the calculations you make? Sure. So you begin with just your general philosophy for for government, your your core principles. And you know, in my case, I'm a limited government conservative. I, I think that the government should do federal government should do the absolute uh, minimum uh, and let states and local governments uh, fill in the gaps. Um, so I guess you begin there. And then at the end of the day, my job is to do what the majority of my constituents want. So, um, you know, I have a very strong pro-life community in my district. So um, I, I do my best to fight for them. And um, I have a lot of business interests in my community, in my district. So we, we make sure that we are, uh, keeping their interests in mind and you know just every district is unique and every district um understandably has different expectations for the role of the federal government and for um what their representative should be doing so for example uh you know some areas of the country as i mentioned earlier in the 70s 80s my district was really struggling um, you know, we didn't have a lot of economic ec economic opportunity. Um, so at that time, the analysis would be different than now when we're thriving. We have dozens and dozens of cranes that are building new buildings. We have people moving to the district from all over the country. And it, it's just remarkable, the growth that we're seeing right now. So, you know, we don't really need a lot of help from the federal government. We need the, gov the federal government to not go bankrupt and destroy the uh, global economy. So, you know, it, it, you just factor all of those variables in. Um, and I guess there's one other thing. It, I do my best to work with with people that are, are like-minded and also people that I respect uh, across the aisle. So there's certain issues that maybe are not really a priority for uh, my district, that my district honestly probably uh, wouldn't be that passionate about, but, um, I work with other people to build those relationships. So when the same, uh, situation arises with them, maybe I can get some help. So on the one side, your principles based, uh, in terms of the way you view your, the opportunities before you for voting or for co-sponsorship. But on the other hand, you're always looking for a trade where your 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 uh, your district can benefit in exchange for something somebody else needs. Uh, getting legislation across the finish line is very challenging, and it, it requires a pragmatic approach. And um, if if I can help someone, I want to help them um, because I would hope that they would return the favor in the future. So I don't know. I don't like necessarily like, like the term trade, but it's really more relationship building to facilitate. Um, success uh, in the legislative arena. Well, great. Well, let's, let's move on to a little bit of your work with the, with the Select Committee of Modernization of Congress, you know, where you're, uh, you've are you got a leadership role currently, um, and you've been able to see all kinds of people come before the committee and talk about how Congress can be improved as an institution. That's what we're talking about here in our, in our series. So maybe we can move through a few different topics and sort of what you've learned through that committee, what if you've, you know, had a change of heart or even through your own other committee assignments, whether you've, you know, kind of uh, come to some conclusions about how Congress can be improved in, as an institution. Um, sure. You know, let me, let me start with how I got on the committee. Uh, sure. That's a great, great way to begin. So um, 
my district is very conservative. I won the primary in June and um, of 2018, I think. That's right. And so I, I began a campaign to get onto the steering committee, the Republican steering committee. And um, I did that because I wanted to help my colleagues um, in my class. And I wanted to build relationships with um, the decision makers within the conference. And I was successful. And um, part of the deal when you get on the steering committee is you um, are, are not hoping to get your first choice for committees. So um, I ended up getting on, on a budget in education and labor. And uh, Leader McCarthy um, was kind enough to make, uh, make me the freshman appointee in the 116th Congress to the Select Committee for the Modernization of Congress. And again, my campaign slogan was Washington is broken. So to be on the committee that is designed to reform Congress as an institution was just a dream come true. Uh, Vice Chair Graves uh, was a mentor of mine and I really enjoyed that committee. There's obviously a lot of partisan bomb throwing in DC and um, that, that has its role but uh, we're not getting a, a lot done in a bipartisan manner right now. And in the last three years, the select committee is six Republicans, six Democrats, and we require eight votes to get anything done. It has been just a, an incredible experience to work with my colleagues across the aisle, to build relationships, to find common ground, to try to fix this place. And so I was uh, originally put on for the first year, the, the committee was extended for a second year and we got into a whole new Congress and Three of the uh, members of the six Republicans actually ended up retiring from Congress. Um, Rodney Davis, who is fantastic, is the Republican leader on House administration. And uh, Dan Newhouse uh, wanted to be the leader of the Western Caucus. So they were left with me. Um, and honestly, it has been awesome to, to be the vice chairman. Um, I have developed a great relationship with Chair Kilmer. And we have a, an awesome staff and we're just really pushing hard to make the most of our two year term. And, you know, we're here we are November of uh, the first year of a two year term. We still have longer right now left in this Congress than we did when we first began as a select committee. So we are in a great position. We've already done a number of recommendations this year. We're about to do some more. And we have all the people uh, in the right spot on the bus and we are flying down the highway and we're, we're hoping for big things ahead. Um, but that's, that's how I came to be here. Little luck, uh, maybe a little being good a little bit. I don't know. Well, it's, uh, it's been very exciting to obviously to watch that committee work and uh, try to work in a way that's going to improve Congress as an institution rather than, um, you know, for the long term for the, for the American people, I think it's fantastic. And, really appreciate the role everybody's played on that committee and your work there as a driving force is just fantastic. Why don't, why don't we go through a couple of different subject matter uh, that, that's been related to some of the committee's work. And obviously some of it's a little bit outside and you haven't quite touched it, but others you know, you've, you've spent a lot of time on. And why don't we start you know, with, with the concept of rules. You know, Congress is ultimately a system of rules, right? It's people and rules, people in process. <laughs> Um, and, you know, the, the most visible process to, to most individuals like myself is going to be the floor, right? What happens on the floor uh, and what rules is the floor governed by? Um, and whatever those rules are, are going to have a big impact on what ultimately Congress does and how it performs. Uh, so can you talk a little bit about how you see the procedure on the floor? Are there ideas to change it, to improve it, to help Congress perform better as an institution? Sure. Uh, my freshman term, I went to see the parliamentarian, Tom Wickham, I, I think probably like 15 times. Um, and I, I, when I was in the state Senate, I spent a lot of time with the clerk and I spent a lot of time on the rules. And so I, I joked with the parliamentarian. I said, I realize I come see you all the time. He's like, and if you want me to talk to your number two or three or somebody else in your staff, that's fine. Like, I just have questions and I need answers. And so he was like, oh, you know, I, I really enjoy spending time with you. This is very rewarding that you're interested, but you know, I, maybe occasionally I will let you have a meeting with my number two. And so the very next meeting that we had, uh, it took like 30 minutes. And the, the person that I was meeting with was like, yeah, I can't answer that. And um, I ended up having a meet with the parliamentarian and he was like, that is the most bizarre question I've ever heard anybody ask. It was, um, 
a just very nuanced rule and there really wasn't an answer for it. But anyways, so all that to be said, I think that the rules of the house um, are very important. And, and this committee has talked a lot about them. I've spent a lot of time with new parliamentarian um, talking about the rules package for the next Congress and what could be included in that to facilitate uh, more, you know, what is the goal? The goal is evidence-based policymaking, um, hopefully that has some collaboration in there and at the very least done from a position of mutual respect. So let's go over that again. Um, evidence-based policymaking that is at least in some degree collaborative and done from a position of mutual respect. So that, if that's the goal, how do we back into it? Um, and while the three things I'm about to talk about are not specific to to text for the rule, rule package, I think they override everything and, and they are, are the solution to the problems that we're facing. Um, I put it into three categories. Uh, one is time and well, I'll go over all. So time, relationship building and incentive structures. So let's talk about time. Time is the calendar. When we're here, when we're traveling, um, the floor schedule, when we're having votes, how we're having votes, um, the committee schedule, subcommittee schedule, trying to deconflict it. Um, in 2019, we were in DC for 65 full days. We were in DC for 65 full days. We traveled 66 days. So we have these three and four day work weeks and um, we're just, I use the term pinballing. You're just running around. You're just all over the place and you're never actually getting anything done. Um, we had a number of freshmen come to an event uh, with uh, the modernization committee on Monday. And we were asking everybody like how many committees and subcommittees do you serve on? Somebody said nine, 10, eight, seven. I mean, you know, at the very least six and they're all overlapping because we're here so infrequently. So you're, well, just yesterday we had a, a meeting, a member meeting, and we had six people attend, two of them briefly, because there were three mark. one of them had three markups going on and had a subcommittee here. So how are we supposed to do our job? How are we supposed to engage in evidence-based policymaking that's collaborative and from a position of mutual respect if you're never together, if you never have a time to build a relationship to actually engage in. So I think time is most important. We made recommendations last Congress um, about the calendar to travel less, to have more full days. Um, we're, we're working some, some block scheduling to deconflict the committee, some mechanisms to decrease the chaos of the floor. So again, that's time and I'll, I'll hurry up. So um, relationship building um, on the Financial Services Committee, which I now serve, I have every single Republican's phone number in my phone, cell phone number. Um, I have three Democrats' cell phone numbers, and I have a relationship with two more. I just don't have their phone numbers. I don't think Emmanuel Cleaver has a cell phone. Um, I'm joking. I bet he does. Um, but, you know, in two of those members that are on the Financial Services Committee, I have a relationship with them, not necessarily because of financial services, but because of modernization. So that's a problem. We need to have more bipartisan opportunities to build relationships. Um, right now, if I wanted to meet with Ed Perlmutter from Colorado, who's on both financial services and uh, the modernization committee, my options are invite him to my office, go to his office. That's kind of home and away. Like, you know, you don't, you don't necessarily want to do that. Uh, I guess we could meet in the speaker's lobby, but because of COVID, there's nothing, there's no chairs. Um, we could go out to dinner. Uh, we have done that. But on campus, there's not a lot of physical space where members can go uh, and, and, and have a cup of coffee or um, get to know each other from a personal, personal perspective. So we've got to change it. We've got to make it easy. We've got to facilitate it. We've got to really focus on giving members opportunities and incentives to get together so they can start to develop personal relationships. I'm not asking anybody to violate the principles. I'm not asking anybody to to give an inch. I just want people to become less nasty. I mean, you know, we just got people that are so mean to each other. And um, 
we, we need to find a way to work together. We will never fix immigration or debt or health care on a party line vote. We got Obamacare on a party line vote, 60 Dems in the Senate. Um, we're never going to have a 60 vote threshold in the, in the Senate. We're just not going to on either side of the aisle. So we need to find a way to work together to address these big problems because debt was the number one national security issue, according to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs in 2010, when we had $11 trillion in debt. Now we got 30 and we're about to have 35 probably by the end of this week. Um, well, 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 there's a lot in there that, you, that, you, that you've covered. In, in terms of, if we just go back to the time element for a moment, right? You know, obviously there's conflicts in terms of the committee meetings. There's, you know, there's the time in Washington. If we just talk about time in Washington for a second, you know, obviously the committee's made recommendations. Um, you might have your personal opinion. What do you think it should be yourself uh, you know, for Congress? Should people be there all year long? You know, 40 hours a week, every day of the year, or, or should it be, you know, the two weeks on, one week off, the four weeks on, one week off? Where do you come down after all the things you've heard and seen in this regard? So I'm working on a, a proposed calendar. Um, I can get us to 77 full days uh, with 48 travel days. Um, and that's a, a hybrid of uh, two weeks on, two weeks off, and one week on, one week off. Again, that's maximizing five day work weeks because if you're if you're coming in on Monday or Tuesday leaving on Thursday or Friday you really only have two full working days so if you can come in on a on a Monday and leave on a Friday and give give committees and give the floor and give everybody more time three full days you can get a lot more done um, there's difference of opinions around that but again if you are going home on Friday you don't have to come back for nine days to then come, you know, you get a full district work period. Um, again, I don't care how we do it. I just, we've got to be here more. 65 days is not enough. Um, and a two day week, all these different competing interests uh, just muck up the schedule. And we've got to find a way to be here more. Um, but, you know, the bigger challenge, one of the challenges is that members of Congress, I mean, sure, we make $174,000 a year, but I live in South Carolina and DC. Um, most people have an apartment here. Apartments in the Navy Yard are $2,500 to $3,000 a month. Um, I, for my first year, I stayed in an apartment that was $2,950. My mortgage in South Carolina is $1,200. So, I, and by the way, in 2019, I slept in that apartment like 50 something nights for an average price of $480 a night. Um, I now stay in a hotel in the Navy Yard it's, it's much more affordable and I actually don't have to do laundry. So it's great. Um, but you know, if we're going to ask people to be here more, we've got to make it easier to serve. You got a family of five in Texas and your wife takes care, your wife or husband takes care of the kids. Uh, you really only make 80, $85,000 after taxes. Um, and you travel all the time and you're never home. So it, it, there's just a lot of variables to this job that make it very challenging to serve. And it also limits who can serve. Um, generally speaking, people in Congress, this is the, either the most money they're ever going to make in their entire life, or they have made a whole bunch of money and they don't care. And that's not reflective of the American uh, citizenry. And we've got to find a way to make it easier to serve. Uh, anyways. So would you go back to the living in D.C. full time thing or do you still feel like there needs to be a lot of time back in the district? I don't think we'll ever do that. Um, you know, it's, it's air travel is too easy. Moving your family is, is too hard. Cost of living in DC is outrageous. Um, I mean, it is absolutely outrageous. If you put my $300,000 house in Greenville, South Carolina on Capitol Hill, it'd be a $2 million house. Well, it might be a $3 million house. I mean, it's crazy. Um, so, you know, the, the quality of living is just so, so different. Um, and, I don't think anybody that's in Congress right now necessarily signed up for that. I would bet 5% max um, of members currently serving live full-time in DC with their families. So that kind of a switch is not going to happen. Um, but making it easier for them to be here and asking them to be here a little bit more and travel a little bit less, I think is very reasonable. And I think everybody wants it. Um, I've talked to dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of members and they want to spend less time in the airports and they want to spend more time working. 
Um, and you can actually do it all. You can spend more time in DC, less time traveling and more time at home with a little magic trick on the schedule. So what, what, how would that manifest itself for like an individual member for a committee chair, like the committee chair, I can see them just not necessarily having to take orders from leadership, right? They can determine what goes to the floor, but what about for the individual member? What does it mean for them? That means they can get legislation in a, you know, brought up in a committee or in a, or on the floor, how, how does it work? What, what, what was it really happens? What does that really so mean? We're, we've been kicking around a couple ideas and these are not fully baked yet. So we still got thir 13 months and we're still working on it. But, you know, something like if, if you have 20% of the R's and 20% of the D's on any given committee that are co-sponsoring a piece of legislation, that is a pathway to get a prize. That prize can be a hearing, a markup, whatever it is. Um, and, you know, that is an incentive to facilitate collaboration, to incentivize members working together. Um, in three years, well, I've been on financial services for two years and four months, three months. Um, we have had one Republican amendment adopted in two and a half years. I mean, it, we're just, there's zero collaboration. Um, so, you know, we've, we've had a couple of suspension bills that, that we've, we've been able to agree on, but, you know, on anything that we've had a markup on, it's just shirts and skins and that's not how it should be. I mean, you know, there's no exchange of ideas. There's no improving it. It's just, we're doing this, sit down and shut up. Like, you know, and, and that's not productive. So, um, we've got to find a way to, uh, facilitate evidence-based policymaking. I mean, you know, uh, we don't have any of that. Um, it's all partisan, terrible policy. And I mean, you know, I I'm not saying that this is the case with only the Dems in control. Um, I, I would actually argue it's probably just as true when the shoe's on the other foot. So we've got to, again, find a way to facilitate this, 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 this collaboration. Um, it's not easy. I think it's interesting to use the co-sponsorship like an automated mechanism to elevate the bill, right? Or elevate the issue. Um, I think that makes a lot of sense uh, and would uh, put it into a kind of a ruler process that is automated, right? Uh, and so that it's not like a discharge petition where it's a very combative exercise. Uh, we even kicked around the idea of a discharge petition with a lower threshold if you have equal number of R's and D's. So, you know, you get to whatever, 18, to 218 to actually do a discharge petition, but why not make it, you know, 180, but you gotta have 90 R's and 90 D's. Uh, just anything that we can do, by, by the way, we're not doing that. Um, but I mean, you know, anything that you can do to cause members to seek out uh, someone from the other side of the aisle to support an idea, because I mean, you know, Alexandria Casas Cortez and I probably don't agree on a lot, but we probably agree on I don't know five or ten percent of the stuff. I know we agree on ethics reform. Um, you know, I think there's some good government stuff that we could we could find common ground on. So why not work with somebody that um, you agree? With? We need to work with people that we agree with on things that we agree on, and appreciate that we don't always have to agree. And if we don't agree. Can't be with you this time. Thanks. But if we do, yeah, let's push. We'll, we'll, we'll try to get it across the finish line. So I want to ask another question a little bit related to this concept. And it kind of goes back to your earlier discussion about reaching across the aisle. If, if they have something they need and you've got something uh, they need, et cetera. You know, but one cross current to that is this idea of party rules, right? You know, there's, there's congressional rules which rule Congress uh, and procedure. But then there are these, you know, Democrats have their rules internally, and then the Republicans have their rules internally. Uh, and, you know, if Republican leadership wants to vote a certain way, then, you know, there's an expectation of X and Democrats want it and there's an expectation of Y. What do you think the role of these party rules are in Congress? Like, for me, I'm a little bit surprised that they can even exist. So I'm curious how do they play into this whole game? You know, is that something that needs to be reformed or is it something that exacerbates the problem or is a part of the solution to the problem? I would probably, I might even disagree 
the party rules are really more party guidelines um, because you know rules imply that everyone follows them and I mean I think both sides um, have a lot of people maybe five or ten percent that don't really care and they're gonna go their way um, so you know I, I don't know if that is necessarily a, a, a source of possible improvement. Maybe it is. Um, we really haven't spent much time on the modernization committee on that subject, just because that's more of an intra-party issue as opposed to a house issue. But um, it, I'm sure it's something that could be could be revisited. I mean, one of the one of the challenges is that the parties hold some of the carrots, right, and some of the sticks for the uh, for members, and so they can control behavior in theory, through those mechanisms. You know, I, I talked earlier in the program to uh, Mickey Edwards. I don't know if you're familiar with any of his opinions, but one of his is that uh, the committee chairs should uh, be elected by the body, right? Um, rather than picked by the party. And I'm curious, you know, those kinds of fundamental changes to the incentive structure might encourage more of the cross-party collaborations that you mentioned before. So my first term, we actually had a vote in conference on whether the steering committee would appoint the um, committee leadership or the steering committee would populate the committee and then the committee would elect the committee leadership. And we went around in circles and the, the thing that came, that kind of com was compelling to me was all you got to it's harder to convince 28 members that have really not a lot of interest, not, not a lot of personal incentive in the outcome of, of, of the question, um, what is the best path forward versus taking, you know, 25 or 30 members on a committee that all have a severe interest in the outcome of the question. And it, it can if I was in the position and I was only trying to get votes out of, you know, the people on my committee, there's, there's deals you can cut, there's help you can give, and there's ways that you can kind of thread the needle. Um, it's better if the, in my mind, it's better if the committee leadership is beholden to the conference as opposed to the members on the committee. But I think reasonable minds can differ there. I mean, somebody I greatly respect disagrees with me. So, um, but I think at the end of the day, that person may just be annoyed that the steering committee doesn't do it. He wants them to. So, you know, try harder to work, work the current system and maybe we can make some changes a little bit. But uh, I, I think the Republicans are doing a fairly good job right now for conference rules. There's a couple of things I would, I would tweak, but um, nothing too crazy. So if we go back to the, the committees for a moment, um, you've, it sounds like you've been on two very, well, uh, among others, you've given examples of two very different committees in terms of their functioning, structure, outcomes. You know, through this process, do you have a magical set of rules that every committee could adopt and we'd be better off? Um, I try not to be partisan, um, but I really think that the manner in which the Dems appoint committee leadership is just not productive. Um, I, I, you know, it, there's too much seniority base. There's too much speaker control. Um, and I, I think if they had a, a system, I mean, if they had term limits, I think that would help. Um, you know, on the Financial Services Committee, uh, Chairwoman Waters and uh, Republican Leader McHenry have virtually, I mean, just have a terrible relationship. I mean, you know, and on a lot of these committees, um, there's just not a lot of legitimate kind of, it's not that there's not bipartisanship. There's not even like core, people aren't even cordial. So, I mean, you know, I, I think if you're going to lead a committee with a Democrat, you need to have a personal relationship and you need to be able to talk to them and be like, you know, we can't, I can't do that, but I understand that's something that's important to you. Um, so we're going to not be able to work together on that, but you know, I'll, I, I'll let you, I'll let you pitch the idea. I mean, you know, and we just, so that's another big problem. And this is maybe, it comes into the whole idea of evidence-based policy making in a collaborative manner with mutual respect. But 
we don't defend our ideas. Nobody in Congress has to defend their ideas. You get five minutes to pontificate or ask mean questions of a witness. You go on the floor, you give a one minute, a five minute speech. You go on CNN or Fox News and spout talking points. You don't even, you don't know what, what's actually going on. And, and I would even say that even leadership doesn't know. I mean, there's a, there's a decent, take Build Back, I don't want to take Build Back better. I don't, I'm, I'm trying not to be partial. But I mean, you know, it's a 2,500 page bill. We don't have CBO score and, and nobody knows what's in it, but we're going to vote on it. And I mean, you know, I'm not saying this would be any different if, if the Republicans were in charge because uh, previously bills have been released and voted on within hours and thousands of pages. And that's just not how it's supposed to work. Like the, the committees are supposed to work on the material and they're supposed to take it through regular order and have hearings and have markups and then put it in. And, uh, you know, if I want to know what's in the infrastructure package, I go to, you know, my buddy on T&I and I say, hey, Dusty, like I'm hearing something about this. Tell me about that. The infrastructure package that we just passed never went through the House Committee on Transportation Infrastructure. <laughs> so, but again, I mean, I'm tables were turned. Not saying it would be different. So, you know, we got to have regular order. We have to actually be able to go through the legislative pro process to engage in evidence-based policymaking. And we don't do that now. It's partisan nonsense. And I mean, again, tables will turn, pendulum will swing. I'm not saying it's going to be different, but I'm going to try to make it different. So it sounds like for the rules, uh, you like the concept of regular order better if you can get the right kind of collaborative spirit there, it, basically going according to the principles you laid out in the beginning, uh, which is this concept of, uh, you know, trying to get real legis evidence-based legislation done. Um, so, you know, what you just mentioned there on the way for discussion, you've brought this up a few times. Maybe we can move into this part of the conversation where it's a similar question I asked for many different um, interviewees so we can kind of compare the answers at the end. And, and the question there is really about how should debate or deliberation or dialogue occur, right? How should it be occurring or how should it be structured in Congress? Because everybody can just be talking at the same time or you can have a very structured discussion. You know, in your experience, you've mentioned some of these kind of personal relationships where that can happen over dinner or it can happen in a common space. Where do you see this of debate, dialogue happening in Congress, where should it happen? Um, should it be open, should it be closed, right? Where do you come out on that? So let me back up. I was in the state Senate for two years. State Senate, we have 46 senators and uh, everything's open. Uh, every, every piece of legislation, anybody can put an amendment on and you will get to go to the well and you will get to say, this is this bill does this, this amendment changes this bill in that way. I think this is important because of these reasons. And then you get questions and it doesn't take long to figure out whether it's a good idea or a bad idea. And you get arrows from your side of the aisle, you get arrows from the other side of the aisle. And if you don't know your stuff, you look like an idiot and you sit down and your amendment is voted down. Um, we don't do that. We don't do that at all. 95% um, of the time, members don't even write their own amendments. It's, it's leadership driven, it's staff driven, and nobody knows what they're voting on, but they know that the chair voted one way and they're either voting with them or against them. Um, so I think part of this comes down to, a, goes back to time. Um, when I speak in financial services, uh, on a, there's 62 people on the committee, something like that, close. 56, 62. Um, when I speak, I'm at the lower end of the dais. Max, maximum, absolute maximum number of members in the room. Eight, seven. Um, there is zero back and forth. I mean, I think I can count on one hand the number of times that we actually had some dialogue between Republicans and Democrats. You know, will the congressman yield for a question? Like that's, well, the senator yield for a question. I, that was something that we did all the time in the Senate and you had to defend your ideas. Um, we actually had, there's one exception to this, uh, Ed Perlmutter from Colorado and I, um, well, it was a financial institution 
um, subcommittee for financial services and uh, Blaine Luke Demeyer, the ranking member on uh, the subcommittee was unable to be there. I got, so I, in my bio, I forgot to mention two things. I got a master's in cybersecurity from NYU. I graduated in May. Um, I got that because of being on financial services and because I'm also in the Air Force. I'm a, I'm a captain in the South Carolina Air National Guard. So there's a cybersecurity component between my committee and my role as a captain in the Air Force. So I got that degree as well. But again, we're sitting here and I'm actually filling in for Blaine Luke Meyer and it's me and Perlmutter, we're buddies and we're having a hearing on uh, cybersecurity for financial institutions and, uh, and you know, the US economy as a whole. And it's something I'm very passionate about. I wrote my master's thesis on how to, how to improve it. And, you know, we're having this great back and forth and the members are actually communicating amongst each other. And we're talking with the witnesses and the witnesses, by the way, are not partisan. They were all just cybersecurity experts and banking and, um, you know, industry. And so it was like a real hearing. Um, I've been here for three years. I've had one real hearing. Uh, so, you know, that's a problem, but it can happen. It can happen. And it was fun because members on both sides of the aisle would come in and they would not understand that this was not a normal hearing. And they would just come and throw bombs and leave and, we just look at each other and be like, oh, he didn't realize that we're actually having a hearing where we're trying to get to the bottom of what is the best path forward. It's not just a partisan nonsense, you know. Anyways, um, you get what I'm saying? So like we yeah, got but to it sounds like ideas. It sounds like in this case, you you think that that's a that's a forum in the in the committee room itself. It's the committee group that's doing this questioning and answering. Right. And that seems to be where you feel like it was appropriate versus the floor versus the back room. Or do you see like each of those have its own piece? All of the above. Literally all of the above. We got to get into a better system of actually exchanging ideas, defending ideas on the floor. There's a lot of ways you can do that. Um, one big thing I'm trying to do. The, the difficulty with. The, the degree of, of difficulty to have 10 members eat dinner on campus and it not being terrible is mind blowing. Um, just the committee, we've tried to have dinners in different places and it's, it's just been awful. Um, the, we were trying to do the Library of Congress, they wanted $4,000 for 10 people. And you know we're like, wait a minute, what? And then we tried to eat in the, I, I call it the bowels of Rayburn. It's like in the sub basement of Rayburn and it was terrible. Uh, we, had, we, had, we had a good exchange, but it's just not a good experience. So. We finally were able to get a room in the Capitol and it was a great experience. And we're trying to trying to create the easy button for people to get together and to bring in guests and to have conversations. Uh, one thing that we're gonna recommend is committee dinners. I think at the beginning of every Congress, every committee should go over to the Library of Congress and have a, a table of 10. You should have four Republicans, four Democrats and two people that are industry experts who are likely to appear before the committee and just break bread. And the chairwoman and the chairman and the, the, the ranking members stand up and say, this is gonna be a good Congress. We look forward to working together. We're going to be civil. We're going to have dialogue. We're not gonna agree on everything, but we're gonna be respectful of one another. And um, these are some of the people that we expect you will be questioning and um, we appreciate their attendance. And so it's, it's an all of the above thing. It is, uh, and I mean, you know, there's no silver bullet, but we got to do it all to try to make it better. You know, I think a lot of it goes back to what you started off with, which is time. Time has to be allocated mm -hmm. for those types of things. And if there's too little time, there's not enough time for any of those things. Uh, and, you know, so how you enforce that time is, a, I guess, a, a, a bigger a bigger challenge and the willingness of the participants. I could talk about time with Congress all day long. And, you know, just something as simple as floor votes. Right now we're doing proxy votes and it's 15 minute votes and it's ridiculous because you have, you know, 10 votes takes three and a half hours and you got to be on the floor the whole time. And it's just not productive. But, you know, there's a world in which we can have votes from one until two and from 530 until 630. And there's no scenario outside of an extraordinary circumstance that we're going to be outside that window. And if you know that every Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday at one o'clock, you will have a vote. And it's not like a wins the, wins the vote, wins the vote, wins the vote, which is what we do right now. Um, and, you know, if you don't have any votes ready at one, next vote's at 530. Um, just stuff like that. And then tighten it up. I mean, 
if you get if you get five minutes here, 10 minutes there, 30 minutes here, that adds up. It adds up. 435, 435 people, their staff, and um, you know, the other obligations they have. I mean, I could easily get you six hours a week messing with you know vote vote times and I can easily if, if we're here more I can easily deconflict committee schedules um, so it, it, we, there's just so many different components to this conversation but we're trying to dial turn all the knobs to get members more time so they can actually do their job so I'm going to change gears a little bit and ask you uh, a different type of question uh, that kind of goes back to our first discussion about the district. So the concept of representation, you know, that a lot of people interpret that, that meaning in many different ways. And I've been surprised in this series how divergent the answers are. So I'm curious from your side, um, how would you define, what's your version of representation? How do you represent your district? Who, who are your constituents uh, and how do you represent them? Um, well, I mean, I represent every citizen in the fourth congressional district and there's multiple components to that one is constituent services. We, we strive to provide the best constituent services possible. And we've universally received very high marks. Um, so that is a critical role of, of being a representative in Congress. And our job is to make sure the federal government is treating the people that sent us, that send us to Congress Right, whether that's Social Security, you know, Medicaid, Medicare, veterans services, whatever it is, federal government needs to be treating my people right, and it's my job to to advocate for them. Um, then it comes back to, I mean, legislating, voting. Um, I, I, it's just the way the system was built in the House. My job is to do what the people of the Fourth Congressional District want the majority of the people in the Fourth Congressional District want. Um, if I disagree, I can be a little, little aggressive and try to change their mind. I'm like, but that's not really what I'm supposed to do. I got a two year term. My job is to represent the majority of the people that send me to Congress um, in my voting actions. Um, the Senate is different. Trustee, I'm a representative. Senators are trustees. They're supposed to do what they think is right regardless of what the people that sent them to the Senate think is right. And that's why they get a six year term. Um, so, you know, uh, I, I, that's, that's- So you put a big differentiation between the House and the Senate when it comes to what representation means. That's interesting. The founders uh, spoke about it at length. Um, literally the, the, the Senate is supposed to do what they think is right on an individual basis. Um, no matter what the majority of their state believes oftentimes they're in line but the six-year term allows them to uh, have that benefit and i mean again originally the senate was not uh, popularly elected originally it was elected by the state legislatures which made them even more insulated right but so how about in terms of the the timing so you know you mentioned that you're in there for two years uh and then you need to get reelected. Uh, what about in terms of the future generations of the district? Do you feel like you represent them as well, or are you really representing just the people who are around today, uh, the the ones who elect, you know, who voted you in, though that or the full district, as you said? Is it the people who are alive today? Do you think about the next generation, two or three generations down, or is that the responsibility of the next set of representatives? No, I, I mean, I really think that whether it's in family and business or just life in general, uh, our, 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 the measure is whether you were able to leave the world better than you found it. And so, uh, you know, whether it is the environment, the economy, uh, economic opportunity, whatever, whatever the metric is, um, the next generation should have more opportunities. Our children should have more opportunities. Our grandchildren should have more opportunities. We got to be good stewards of the environment for them. We can't destroy destroy the environment to, to, for economic gain in the short term. Uh, all of these things go into account. So yeah, I mean, our, our whole goal is to pass down what has been given to us. Uh, my grandfather uh, had incredible adversity in his life. And 
he had he fought in World War II. He got polio. He was a a bomber pilot, and he um, had eight children and built three businesses, and um, you know gave all of his kids incredible opportunities. And I'm benef- I benefited because of his hard work and because of my father's hard work. So we gotta we gotta give our kids and our future generations better opportunities we had, I think that's the measure in which we will all be judged by. All right, next question is really, uh, and maybe you've thought this through having experience on the modernization committee and coming to Congress, but what fundamental, in your mind, institutional improvement should Congress make within a 50 year time frame? So I think one of the big challenges we have right now is the 24 hour news cycle, media, social media, Um, I think that we're going to figure out how to fix this. It just takes time. Um, You look at the history of the printing press, um, you know, for the first couple decades, people just printed whatever they wanted to print and nobody knew if that was the truth or whether it was authoritative or whatever. And so they had to find ways of, giving people an understanding of the degree of legitimacy of what was printed. And then you have newspapers. The same thing happened again. I mean, you know, people print nonsense and uh, just because it's in a newspaper doesn't mean it's true. But then there were, there were kind of a cultural shift to create better standards and um, people developed views over the, uh, the journalistic integrity of the material that was being published. So now we have social media where any idiot can publish whatever they want and it can have no basis in reality or be the absolute most slanted thing in the history of the world. If you look at if you look at the the different terms of use between YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, uh, you know, Twitter, all these different things, you have something like I don't know if you remember when Speaker Pelosi, there was a video that made her seem like she was drunk. And, you know, I actually disagree with what, what happened. They didn't all treat it the same. Um, some, some platforms deleted it, blocked it. Some platforms marked it, said this has been digitally altered. Some platforms just let it go. Um, and so as a consumer of information, how am I supposed to know if the speaker was drunk or wasn't drunk? I mean, who do I trust? Uh, Twitter said it's fine. It's, it's a parody. Just leave it up. Uh, you know, YouTube said, this is awful. I'm going to take it down because it's misleading. But we got to figure that out. And I mean, I'm sure you've spent time thinking about Section 230 of the 1996 Communications Decency Act and how we can reform that. And I wrote a paper on that when I got my master's too. But so that is a really critical component of how we're going to get our society back in a more unified direction because we're so fractured right now but i think the largest reason we're fractured is the flow of information the flow of disinformation and the ability for anyone with a keyboard to espouse knowledge and expertise Um, we've got to figure out as a society a way to call the nonsense and to bring back some uh, journalistic integrity. And I think this pandemic has probably done more to harm that because now we're even talking about science. You know, nobody, nobody controls science anymore because every elected official has taken every side of every scientific issue. Well, my last question is just around your plans, priorities for the rest of your term and beyond that. Um, you know, what do you have, what do you have in the hopper? What are you working on? And uh, what do we look forward to? I love the modernization committee. Um, you know, my campaign slogan was Washington's broken and I'm the lead Republican in charge of fixing Congress. Uh, it's just a dream come true. We've got a great team. Um, the members on the committee are all pushing in the same direction. We're not going to be unanimous this Congress on a couple things, and that's fine. But uh, we're going to propose some big, big changes that hopefully will make this place work better. You know, I got to get reelected if I want to continue to to fight to make this place better. So, 
I got to deal with that. And, you know, we've done an incredible job in constituent services, like I've talked about, um, being on the financial services committee, being on steering, leading a committee, being a deputy whip, all of these things make me in every room of decision-making in the Republican conference in the house. So I think we're doing great. I hope to continue. Uh, but you know, it's gonna be a long, long 13 months and, um, you know, 118th Congress, I think is probably one of the most incredible opportunities that this institution will have to fix some problems. Um, the rules package is something that I'm working very hard on right now to try to, again, address, you know, incentive structures and the speaker has the ability to do so much, um, either for good or for bad. So, you know, got to make sure that we're moving in the right direction. And, um, but, uh, I, I do think that we've violated some institutional norms and, we're really going to, we're, we're just in a bad spot. So we got to, we got to change course and we got to start moving in the right direction, but a lot of opportunities ahead. And we got a great team, both in my uh, district office and the DC office and on the committee. So we're going to be working hard and uh, hoping for the best. Great. Well, Congressman Timmons, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure and uh, best of luck in the coming 13 months. Hey, thank you so much. Uh, great to be with you. 